Okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, hey guys. Okay. So um, Professor Motlu actually uh, couldn't be here to give lecture today. So I'm Manesh. I'm one of your course TAs and one of Owner's PhD students. And so I'll be giving lecture today. And so I'm going to talk about timing and verification in digital circuits. So the required reading is actually the same as it was for the lecture yesterday. And um, keep in mind that next week we're going to talk about the von Neumann computing model and some computing architectures. And, and you should read about this before you get to lecture, right? OK, so what are we going to learn about today? So first, we're going to cover timing and combinational circuits. And then we're going to talk about timing and sequential circuits. And then finally, we're going to talk about circuit verification for both of these circuits. And this is really you know, checking if your circuit actually works and how can we make sure we get that in both functionality and in timing. So we're going to start off talking about with some trade-offs in circuit design. Right? And so there's a lot of different things you might consider when you're designing a circuit. And so the first is area. And the circuit area would be proportional to the amount of actual you know, circuitry that you're designing. And this sort of reflects the cost of the device. And you might care about speed and throughput, which reflect the performance of your design, because we always want faster, more capable circuits. And we might care about power and energy, because a lot of devices, such as mobile devices, might have power constraints. And high performance devices will dissipate so much power that you, know, you don't want them to start melting or something like that. And finally, design time, which is more subtle. But um, engineering designers are actually quite expensive. And the competition is not going to wait for you to finish perfecting your design, right? They'll go ahead and send out their product. And so you might care about any of these, depending on what you're doing. And so just here are some pictorial examples for different types of devices. And for each of these, you might care about different goals, right? So for circuit timing, um, so far we've really been talking about logical functionality, like whether our circuit actually implements the logic function we want. And so what about timing, right? How fast is the circuit that we're actually designing? And how can we go ahead and make a circuit faster? And what actually happens if we try and run our circuit too fast? So a design that's logically correct can actually still fail because of real world implementation issues. And this is centered around this timing, and that's what we're going to talk about in today's lecture. So we're going to start out talking about combinational circuit timing. So there's this concept of combinational circuit delay. And this means that the outputs of a circuit don't actually change instantaneously with the inputs. And this happens for a multitude of reasons. And chief among them, first, transistors take a finite amount of time to switch from one state to another. And this really means that gate outputs are going to be delayed with respect to the inputs that come into the circuit. And so here's a pictorial representation of this. And so here we have a simple inverter with an input A and an output Y. And we have some timing diagrams showing when the inputs and outputs switch. Right? So when we switch the input A from 0 to 1, the output actually switches sometime later. And this is referred to as a delay of the circuit. So unfortunately, this is a rather oversimplified view of circuit delay. Um, we can say that delay is fundamentally caused by actual circuit parameters, such as capacitance and resistance. And also the fact that the speed of light is actually finite, right? So the electric field doesn't propagate instantaneously. And if you actually look on a nanosecond and picosecond scale like these circuits operate, it's actually not that fast. And so what, what we really know is that anything that affects these quantities can actually affect the circuit delay. And so this ranges from you know, rising and falling input transitions uh, to you know, different inputs having different delays. So if you have multiple inputs to your design, the paths from input to output will be different. And even changes in the environment, such as temperature and voltage. And all of these can really affect the delay in your circuit. And so this all comes together in saying that we actually have a range of possible delays that your circuit might exhibit. So we can quantify this range by giving a minimum and a maximum delay time. And so the minimum delay, we define a term called contamination delay. And for the maximum delay, we define a term called propagation delay. And so here's an example circuit to illustrate this principle. Here we have two inputs and one output. And in the terms of a timing diagram, if we try and change the input A, there's some finite amount of time before the output changes. And so this gray arrow here represents the contamination delay of the circuit, which is the minimum possible time after the input changes such that the output will change. And the propagation delay is the blue arrow, which represents the maximum amount of time that could potentially pass. And all the time in between, uh, we have this cross-hatching notation, which means that it's possible that the output value is actually changing at that point in time. So this is the minimum and maximum delay, and any time in between, the output could potentially be changing. OK, so we, we actually can use this to determine the longest and shortest path in our design. And it turns out we care about both the longest and the shortest path. And we'll actually see why later in this lecture. So here's an example circuit which illustrates this. The blue path shown here is the critical path in the design because it goes through three different logic gates. So it has the delay of all three of these gates. However, the shortest path only goes through one gate, and so there's only one gate delay. And so we can enumerate these in terms of the individual gate delays if we wanted, assuming that the wires actually don't have delay. And we find out that the propagation delay through this critical path is the sum of the propagation delays through the individual components. Right? So we have two end gate delays and one OR gate delay, so we express that as an equation. And for the shortest path, we care about the minimum delay, which is the contamination delay. 
And so here we just have the contamination delay of one end gate. And so we've effectively enumerated the longest and the shortest path in the design. So here's a real world example to put that into perspective. So if you're trying to design a physical circuit in lab with you know, some NAND gates, this is a kind of chip that you might use. You know, you'd connect things to these different pins and observe what happens. And so if we look at the diagram from the data sheet, the inputs and outputs are wired to four different NAND gates in this design. And so if we look in the data sheet, we actually have one entry for this concept called propagation delay, which is what we just talked about. And a bunch of values are given in terms of nanoseconds for various different conditions across different voltages and different temperatures, right? And there's actually a huge difference in delay when we vary these parameters. They can vary from between seven nanoseconds to 135 nanoseconds just by changing the environmental conditions. And this is very significant, right? And so these other factors that we've talked about, such as the different combinational paths and things like that, also affect this propagation delay and contamination delay. And so, so there can be a huge difference, and that's good to keep in mind. And so we can go through an academic example to kind of put this into a better perspective. And so we're going to come back to you know, our favorite multiplexer design. And so we're going to have two different implementations for this four to one multiplexer. And so here's just a quick table that highlights some different circuit delays, for example. So if we have a NOT gate, you know, 30 picoseconds and so forth for other components. So the first design we consider is what we'll just call implementation one. And it uses a series of end gates feeding an OR gate at the output, right? And so we compute some values here. We compute the propagation delay from the S input to the output and the propagation delay from the D input to the output. And we have two different values here based on these gate delays here. However, we can implement this a different way. You know, we can use tri-state buffers on the output where the D input is no longer going through two gates, but just one, tri one tri-state buffer. And it's all connected to the output. And if we recompute these values, we see that they're actually significantly smaller in both cases than for implementation one. And, and the takeaway here is that you know, different designs for the exact same thing can have completely different delays. And so it's really in your interest as a designer to choose an implementation that minimizes exactly what you want. Um, so we, we have to add a disclaimer here because calculating the longest and shortest paths is not nearly as simple as it kind of seems from these examples. Um, this, this happens for a number of reasons. And a, a lot, uh, one big reason is that not all input transitions actually affect the output. And this, this is just true by nature of the logic function you're implementing, right? By switching one input, your output might actually not be dependent on that for the particular value of the other inputs that you've chosen. Uh, similarly, you might have multiple different paths from one input to the output, and you actually have to consider every single one of those paths in your delay computations. Another big reason is that in, in reality, circuits aren't actually all built exactly the same. So if you go fabricate a circuit in the, in the factory, you know, different instances of the exact same gate might have different delays. And so you have to account for all of this variation between different circuit components. Um, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we were assuming that wires have no delay, but in reality, wires do have a lot of delay. And it actually scales with the length of the wire. So if you have one big wire going from one end of the chip to the other, you might actually have a massive delay along that wire, which begins to compete with the gate delays. Um, additionally, uh, as we said, like, environmental effects affect the circuit speeds, right? like temperature and voltage. And it's important to note that not all circuit elements will be affected exactly the same way. Right? So the, the way that temperature impacts a wire delay might be different from the way it impacts a gate delay. And this can actually change the critical path in your design, right? So if you're considering different operating points, you really have to consider all of these factors and figure out what's really the worst case. And when you know, people in industry go and design these really big processors and things like that, they try and assume these worst case conditions for all of these different parameters. And they'll run statistical simulations to try and balance the amount of yield they get in the factory versus like the performance of the design. Because if you're too aggressive with performance, then your yield will go down. But on the other hand, if you're not aggressive enough with the performance, then you know, it's, not, it's, it's just not a performant design. So the, the designer really has to consider all of these things when you're actually doing this in practice. So as a summary of all these combinational timing that we've gone over, um, circuit outputs can change sometime after the input actually changes, right? And this is caused by a number of factors, but mostly because of the finite speed of light and the fact that the delay is dependent on the actual gate you're using, the design of the gate, you know, different inputs that you're using, different environmental states. Um, this leads to a range of possible delays, which we characterize with a minimum and maximum delay called the contamination and propagation delays, respectively. Right? And we note that different circuit topologies can actually have completely different delays. OK, so now that we've talked about combinational circuit timing, we can introduce this concept of circuit glitches. And so what is a glitch? Well, a glitch is when one input transition on a piece of combinational logic causes multiple output transitions. And so we can see how uh, we, have, we have an example to see how that might happen. So, so here's a circuit with three inputs and one output. And so this is the initial state of the circuit, right? The function of these inputs is a one at the output. And so what happens if we make the second input transition from one to zero? So what, effectively, what happens on the output, right? So it turns out there's two different paths to get from this input to the output. 
Um, one's a slow path because it goes through three different gates, and one's a fast path because it only goes through two different gates. And so what we actually observe in the end is that the output first goes through zero when um, the fast path evaluates, but finally when the slow path catches up, the circuit goes back to one. And so in the long term, the circuit really hasn't done anything, right? It was one previously, and now it's one, but we've seen this zero transition in the middle, and this is what we call a, what we call a glitch. And so here's a timing diagram representing the same thing. So if we label these input nodes to the OR gate at the end as N1 and N2, we see that N2 actually switches before N1 does. And the end result is that the output Y briefly goes to zero before going back to one. And this is our circuit glitch. And so generally, this, this, you know, this could be a very bad thing. And so what can we do about this? Well, it turns out we can actually avoid it using a K-map. And so glitches are directly visible in K-maps. Uh, if you recall from the lecture on K-maps, the K-map shows the result of a change in a single input transition, right? And so here we have a K-map for our example circuit. And so what's happening is this transition of one to zero is when this input B goes from zero to one. So we're looking at this piece right here. And in fact, we're actually moving between two different prime implicants that the circuit implements, right? So this A bar, B bar is implemented here, and BC is implemented here. And we're moving between these, and that's when the glitch occurs. And so, you know, for an arbitrarily complex circuit, we can look at our, our K map, and then we can see that if we're moving between these two, it's possible that we might have a glitch. And this also means it's actually quite easy to fix. All we have to do is handle this implicant as well. And so in our actual solution to this glitch, we'll implement this term, which in terms of um, Boolean logic is called the consensus term, but it's essentially the other implicant that we have. And so now we're no longer using just two prime implicants, we're ad adding this additional third one. And basically what this means is that there's no point in this circuit anymore at which you can move between two different implicants, right? And so in terms of circuit implementation, it looks kind of like this, where we implement this A bar C term shown in green. And so the important thing to note here is that this A bar C has no dependence whatsoever on B. And by looking at the K map, we can actually see easily what term we need to add, right? And so now that this has no dependence on B, we're not going to get a glitch, because when B switches, you know, the, the output is really determined by the inputs A and C, which are stable. And so, excuse me, the question we have to ask is that, do, do we always actually care about these glitches? Because uh, fixing glitches is rather undesirable, right? We've added more chip area, we're introducing more power consumption, it requires more design effort. It's just generally a bad thing. And, and really, it, the circuit will eventually converge to the correct value, regardless of how glitchy it is. Right? So uh, the, the answer to this question is no, we don't always care about glitches. And you know, it, it, it's easy to say that, you know, if we only care about the long-term steady state value of our circuit, then we can safely ignore glitches in our design. But for example, if you remember from the last lecture, if we're implementing finite state machines, Maybe we don't want to observe a glitch, because from the traffic light example, you know, we don't want a red light to glitch to green before going back to red, right? That could lead to misleading signals. And so in that sort of application, we would care about glitches. And so it's really up to the designer to decide if glitches matter in their system. But it's, it's good to be aware that this is something that could happen with your combinational logic if you design it in such a way. Okay, so now we're gonna talk quickly about some sequential circuit timing. So sequential elements from last time. So if you recall uh, the D flip-flop, so the D flip-flop looks something like this. And the D flip-flop samples the D input at the active clock edge, and it outputs that sampled value to Q, right? And so we can think of this as a storage element because it's storing the sampled value until the next active clock edge comes by. So the important thing to note is that the D flip-flop is actually made from combinational elements. And we saw that last lecture, right, where we implemented this out of NAND gates, and you, know, you could take it down all the way to the transistor level. But what this means is that all these uh, inputs and outputs, D clock and Q, all have different timing requirements that we have to obey in order to have our abstraction of this D flip-flop being a storage element. And so now we're gonna talk about the timing requirements for these three. So we're gonna start with the D input, and we're gonna talk about the time constraints surrounding it. So what we really need to ensure is that the D input must be stable when it's sampled, right? So when this active clock edge comes by, we need to make sure that the D input is stable before and after the clock edge. And we define a bunch of terms to represent the amount of time it has to be stable. So we have three terms here. The first is setup time, which is the amount of time before the clock edge that the D input needs to be stable. Um, the hold time is the time after the clock edge that the D input needs to be stable. And the aperture time just represents the sum of these two, right? It's just setup plus hold. It's basically this entire time around the clock edge that the circuit needs, that the D input needs to be held stable. And so we need to observe these timings in order to make sure the D flip-flop you know, operates as we expect it to. And so we can ask, what happens if we actually violate this, right? And we come back to this concept of metastability, which was briefly mentioned in the last lecture. So if the D input is changing when it's sampled, we, can, we, we basically enter a metastable state. And so, so what does this mean? This means that the flip-flop output will be stuck somewhere between one and zero for a while, and then eventually it'll converge non-deterministically to either one or zero. 
And so here's a real world illustration of this happening. So this is an actual voltage signal that's sampled from a D flip flop. And so the top is a, uh, sorry, from a NAND RS latch actually in this case, but uh, it operates the same way. And so we have a clock signal shown in yellow and the Q output shown in green. And so here we violated the input timing and we, the, the Q output's actually going metastable, right? Because here the value is neither zero nor it's one. It's somewhere in the middle. And then over many different trials of testing this thing, it converged either to zero or one non-deterministically. And so this is no good, right? Because our circuit's not really doing, uh, we, we can't predict what the circuit's gonna do. It's just gonna do something random. And so this is no good. And so we wanna avoid this case. And so now let's talk about the output timing as well. So we have this output Q. And so here we're not in control of the output per se, but there are some timing things that we need to worry about, right? And so again, analogously to combinational logic, there'll be some delay from when the clock, the active clock edge comes to when the Q actually changes. And that's, uh, again, the, there's a minimum and maximum delay and there's a range of delays, right? And so that's illustrated here in the timing diagram. Like the clock comes and the Q input starts changing sometime shown by this arrow and it finishes changing sometime shown by this arrow. And we define two terms for this. And these are, again, analogous to combinational logic, right? There's a contamination delay, which is the minimum time. And we call this clock to Q because it's the time from when the clock comes to when Q starts changing, right? And then we have a propagation delay, which is the longest possible time. And so these two times characterize when the, input, when the output will begin and end changing after the clock edge. So if you recall the sequential system design from last lecture, we'll have two flip-flops and some sort of combinational logic in the middle, right? And so this is how we implemented all sorts of different designs. And you know, it's how we begin to implement something much bigger like a processor. And what we have here really is multiple flip-flops connected with some sort of combinational logic. And the clock is connected to both of these flip-flops. And we say that it runs with some sort of cycle time, which we'll call T sub C, all right? And we need to make sure that we meet timing requirements for both flop R1 and R2, such that our circuit will operate exactly like we expect. And so now we're gonna go through and see what this really means in terms of the individual delay components that we've been talking about. So we wanna ensure collect correct sequential operation, right? And so this really means that we need to control timing for this flip-flop R2, because here it's the output. We can't control anything per se, but we can control when the input arrives relative to the clock for R2. So we need to make sure that timing is met here. And so specifically, we need to say that the D2 input to R2 must be stable at least T set up before the clock and at least T hold after the clock, right? So it's exactly the same constraints as we need for the input timing for a single flop, right? And so all of this comes into the delay of the combinational logic, the delay here, and, and we'll see this moving forward. So what this means in terms of our sequential circuit design is that there's a minimum and a maximum delay between the two flip-flops that we need to observe. If the combinational logic is too fast, then we'll violate the hold time requirement of R2, which is illustrated by this gray curve right here. Like the, the clock to Q delay is so short, and then the combinational logic delay is so short that we end up violating the hold time for circuit R2, uh, flip-flop R2, excuse me. And if the combinational logic is too slow, we, if we follow this blue curve, and we actually end up violating the setup time for R2. And so we really need to make sure we're meeting both the minimum and the maximum requirements. And the variable that's really under our control here is this combinational logic, right? Because we're designing that, we're choosing what goes into it. Okay, so in order to observe the set of time constraints that we need to meet, um, we, we observe that it depends on the maximum delay from R1 to R2, right? Because the longer the combinational logic is, the more likely we are to violate the set of time constraints. And what we're saying here is that the input to R2, called D2, needs to be ready at least T set of time before the next clock edge, right? And if, if, we, if we manage to observe this timing, then we should be good. And so we can put all of this in terms of the cycle time, right? The time between different clock edges. And so this whole time we'll call T sub C, and we need to make sure that this time is greater than or equal to the individual components, which are the propagation delay from clock to Q, the propagation delay through the actual combinational logic, and finally the set of time that we need to observe. And so we end up with this nifty equation that sort of describes all of these different variables in the term of something that we can work with. So an interesting thing that we observe here is that all of these terms are not under our control, right? It, it turns out that actually only the propagation delay is where we're doing any useful work because our combinational logic is evaluating some function that we want to evaluate, right? It's doing what we want. Whereas the other two, the propagation delay from clock to Q and the setup time for the next flop are just requirements that we need to meet. Like they're essentially, we need to meet that in order to be safe, but we're not doing any useful work during there. And so we can actually define a term, which is called sequencing overhead, which is the amount of time wasted every single cycle just because of these types of requirements, which are, are called sequencing element timing requirements. And so the only way you can really affect these is by you know, using a different sequencing element. So you could use a different type of flip-flop or something like this, but it's not directly controllable, right? You'll still have these constraints. And maybe if you can make setup time shorter, you'll make hold time longer. Uh, one way or another, the only time you're really doing useful work is here.
Okay, so this means that the, the set of time constraint is really limiting our clock, right? And so it's what determines our design performance. And so if you recall from earlier, we have this critical path here, which is the path with the longest propagation delay. And so we consider this in our set of time constraint to figure out how performant our design is. And so here's this equation that we just derived and it's replicated here. And propagation delay is really the propagation delay through this critical path, right? And so we note that overall design performance is determined by this particular critical path. Um, it essentially determines the minimum clock period that we can safely use, right? Uh, and this is the same thing as saying the maximum operating frequency of our circuit. So we, uh, there's two ways to look at this, right? So if the critical path is too long, our design will actually run very slowly. And, and that's not desirable, right? Because we want a highly performant design. But if the critical path is too short, every single cycle will do very little useful work because this term will be very small compared to these two. And so the sequencing overhead will be so big that most of our operating time is just wasted. And so we don't want to fall into either of these cases. Okay, so now we can talk about the hold time constraint, which is the other side of this equation, right? And so the hold time constraint is exactly the opposite. It depends on the minimum delay from R1 to R2. And in terms of the timing diagram, this really means that, you know, the combinational of the clock to Q contamination delay and the contamination delay through the combinational logic, if those are so fast, they'll violate the hold time of the next flip-flop, right? And we want to avoid that. So in this particular case, we can start with the same approach, but we're considering the hold time as the overall side of the equation. And so we need to make sure that the hold time is less than the clock to Q contamination delay for this particular flip-flop and the contamination delay through the combinational logic, right? So we, we essentially just end up with this equation with these two terms. And um, if we rearrange this a little bit, this means that we need to have a minimum combinational delay through our logic. And so if you recall earlier, I said that you know, we care about the shortest path through our combinational logic as well. And this is why, because the shortest path can't be too short, otherwise we'll violate our hold time, right? And our circuit won't work. One other interesting thing about this equation is that it does not depend on the clock frequency, right? So we, the, the clock doesn't play into this at all. And so we can't simply fix such a violation by just changing the clock period, right? We can't just slow things down and expect it to start working. It's, it's an inherent property depending on the types of flip-flops we choose and the combinational logic we design. Okay, so let's put all this together into a timing analysis. And so here we just have an easy example. So there's just some circuit with four inputs which are coming out of flip-flops and it ends up in two different outputs, right? And so we're given a bunch of different delays to work with, right? The setup constraint, hold time constraints, and you know, the delays per gate. And so we want to ask, like, what, what is our maximum frequency we can operate at, which we can determine by using our setup time constraints? And does our hold time constraint even hold, right? And so by checking these two, we can check whether our circuit will actually work. And so we start by enumerating the propagation delay and the contamination delay through our circuit. So the propagation delay here turns out to be the longest path because we're just modeling delays per gate. And so we end up with three gate delays, right? Which is very simple. So three propagation delays as 105 picoseconds. Uh, okay, cool. So then we consider the contamination delay and there's actually two paths. Uh, both of these paths go through exactly one gate. And so for both of those, it's just one gate contamination delay, which is 25 picoseconds, right? So now we have these variables evaluated and we can go ahead and check our equations. So we check the set of time constraints and we find out that our maximum you know, cycle time, oh sorry, our minimum cycle time is 215 picoseconds, which results in a maximum operating frequency of some value, 4.65 gigahertz. Okay, so we need to run at that frequency or slower, right, in order to make the circuit work with the set of time constraints. Second, we can check the hold time constraints. And so this depends on our contamination delays, right? And so we get this inequality. And it actually turns out this is a fail, right? Because um, this, this constraint's not satisfied. And that means we're gonna get a hold time violation on one of these flip-flops, or one or both potentially. And, and our circuit's just not gonna work. So we wanna fix this somehow. And so how do we do that, right? And so we, since this equation doesn't depend on clock frequency, we, we can't just change the clock to do that. We actually need to change the combinational delay paths. And so um, because we have two different paths here, we need to extend those paths to make them longer. And so what we do is we add two buffers here. Now remember the buffer doesn't change the logic functionality of the particular circuit, right? If the input's one, the output's one. If the input's zero, the output's zero. And so what we've effectively done is we've made both of these paths longer. And so now when we go ahead and evaluate our propagation delay and contamination delay, the contamination delay is longer, right? It's actually two gate delays for both of these cases. And so we end up 50 picoseconds. Um, so if we check our setup time constraints, we actually note that there's no change to the maximum frequency because we haven't changed the propagation delay, right? We haven't changed the worst case path through our circuit. It's still two gate delays here, two gate delays, but three through this path. And so we can still operate just as fast as we were, but now the hold time constraint, this contamination delay through our logic has actually increased. And so now the circuit passes. And so we can say that this circuit will operate correctly if we go build it as is, right? So this is great. So there's actually one more thing we have to talk about in all of this, and that's clock skew. And clock skew is something that really messes with our design. 
right? So um, essentially clocks have delay as well, right? Because we're sending the clock from one place on the chip to all sorts of other different places. And the clock doesn't actually reach all parts of the chip at the same time. And what this means is that different flip-flops will receive effectively different clocks, right? The clock will be delayed to one flip-flop versus another. And so we define a term called clock skew, which is the time difference between two different clock edges at two different places. Right? And so here's an illustration to describe that. And so we have a clock source close to this flip-flop A, and then we have a flip-flop B, and the clock takes a really long time to get to flip-flop B through this horrible, ugly combinational path, right, for whatever reason. And so what we'll observe is that while point A sees the clock just like the clock source, point B will actually see a delayed clock. And there's this clock skew in between by how much the clock has been delayed by the time it gets to flip-flop B. And so this is very bad. And so for a real-world example, here's a plot taken from a processor that was designed in the 90s called the Alpha 21264. And this, this plot shows the spatial distribution of the clock skew across the chip. So the X and Y axes are the spatial locations among the chip, right? And the, y, the Z axis shows the clock skew at that point in the chip. And so the particular shape of this is not important because it depends on how they decided to send the clock signal across the chip. But what's important is that we have lots of different clock skews at different points in the chip, right? So a flip-flop here is seeing a really big clock skew relative to a flip-flop down you know, somewhere in these valleys. And, and that's relative to the source at which the clock is generated. Okay, so this is very bad. And so we need to reevaluate our setup time and hold time constraints in light of clock skew. So if we look at setup time again, we actually see that you know, if we want to be safe with our timing, we have to consider the worst case clock skew, right? Our circuit should work with no clock skew or with the worst case possible skew. And so for, for, for setup time constraints, this actually turns out to be when the clock arrives at R2 before it gets to R1. So if the clock gets here first, and then it gets here, this leaves as little time as possible for the combinational logic. And so in terms of the timing diagram, um, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it really means that we have an extra term in our equation, which is a T skew. And so what this really means is that we have an extra constraint, and you can think about this either as, you know, decreasing the amount of, uh, like, you know, we have to increase our cycle time to compensate for it, which decreases our operating frequency, or we have to have less combinational logic, right? Our propagation delay path needs to be shorter in order to make this work. And so, yes, yeah, so there's an extra term in our equation to reflect this. For the hold time constraints, the situation is kind of analogous, but reversed. And um, again, safe timing requires us to consider the worst case delay, right? But in this case, it's the opposite, where the clock arrives at R2 after it arrives at R1. And what this does is it increases the minimum required delay through our combinational logic, right? So our contamination delay needs to be greater. And again, in terms of the timing diagram here, we just have an extra term in our equation, which really says that the contamination delay we thought of as previously being just these two terms actually needs an extra term in there, so it needs to be bigger. Okay, so. Just in general, this clock skew thing is very bad, right? Because skew is effectively increasing both our setup time and hold time constraints, and we don't want to have to deal with this. Um, what, it's, what it means in terms of our actual operation is that it's increasing the amount of sequencing overhead we have, right? So for a fixed cycle, we're doing less work than we previously were able to, and, and that's not good. So in general, you, we want to design our system to have as little clock skew as possible. And so what this really requires from the designer is some intelligent way to route the clock across the chip, right? And so this is called a clock network. Like, it's how we distribute our clock to different flip-flops. And the goal is that the clock arrives at all different places on the chip at approximately the same time. And so here are just some quick examples of how people try and solve this problem, right? They have all these complicated designs where they're starting with the clock up here, splitting it into trees, which split into more trees, or there's different meshes that distribute the clock. And there's just a lot of very complicated solutions to try and make sure this is equal all across the chip. But the, the real takeaway here is that you really shouldn't be messing with logic on the clock path unless you really know what you're doing, right? Because you'll end up with something like this. Okay. So now that we've gone through both combinational and sequential timing, we can sort of talk about circuit verification, right? And so circuit verification deals with, you know, how do we know that a circuit actually works? And so there's two parts to this. Um, have you designed it correctly in terms of functionality? And have you designed it correctly in terms of timing? Because even if it's functional, uh, functionally correct, it might not meet your timing constraints, right? Which, which is not good. And so the question is, how can we test for both of these things? And, and our answer is actually quite easy. For the most part, it's simulation tools. You know, we have a lot of tools available to us when we're designing circuits. And so some of them are formal verification tools, which we're not going to touch on too much in this class because you know, it gets very complicated very fast. But it effectively tries and makes sure that all your logic paths do exactly what you think they're doing. Um, we're going to use some HDL timing simulations, such as, for example, with the Xilinx Vivado tool that you're using. We can simulate different logic paths throughout our Verilog model, and we can see what they're doing. And then finally, we have you know, circuit simulation tools, which can actually simulate at the circuit level you know, the voltage, the current, all the different things that are going on. 
And so we can use all of these to do both functional and timing verification. And so what, at a high level, what does this look like for a big design, right? So if we're trying to test a big processor or something, what's going on? And so it actually turns out that testing is one of the most time-consuming design stages for a big design, right? And as you can imagine, we have to do functional correctness testing for every single logic path in the design. I mean, that's ideal. We would do that. But in practice, it's usually not feasible to test every possible path because you know, there's combinations on combinations of these. And uh, we also have to check the circuit level parameters for all of our different circuit elements, right? Like timing, power, the timing constraints we have. And so we need to check all of that too. And so one, one big point to make is that the low level circuit levels, uh, you know, circuit type simulations are much, much slower than high level simulations, such as, you know, Verilog simulation or, or C, C++ sort of simulations. And we're going to deal with this in this class, which is at the functional level. But the, the circuit simulations are really to check these circuit level parameters, right? And that's much slower. And so we don't want to have to test functional verification. We don't, we don't want to have to verify functionality also at the circuit level. And so our solution to this is to kind of split up responsibilities. So we have a high level model, which is Verilog or C or something like that. And we're only going to check functionality there. We're not going to worry about timing, right? So this is good because we have relatively fast simulation times compared with the circuit level stuff. And we, that means we can actually get pretty high code coverage, right? We can test lots of different circuit paths and, you know, uh, sorry, logic paths and make sure that they're all doing exactly what we think they're doing. And it's pretty easy to write and run tests because it's, it's just high level code. You just write it out. You don't have to deal with like complicated circuit schematics or things like that. And then for the circuit level, we only check timing and power, right? We've completely separated this. We don't do any functional testing here, which means that we can uh, simulate much faster because we don't have to try and cover all of this logic. We can just make sure that each circuit element is going to work as it's designed. Um, what we do have to do, however, is check functional equivalence of the circuit model to the high level model. So we need to make sure these two are doing the exact same thing. And given that the high level model is functionally correct, this would mean that the circuit level model is also functionally correct, right? And so this is a hard problem in general, but it's much, much easier than trying to test every possible combinational path at the circuit level. And so um, we, we basically have lots of different tools to handle these different levels of verification now that we split these responsibilities, right? And so logic synthesis tools, such as what we're using in our labs with our FPGAs, will basically guarantee this equivalence of the high-level model that you write in Verilog to the synthesized circuit-level description, right? So we, we don't really have to worry about that. Um, timing verification tools exist to try and help check all your circuit timings. So once you've developed the circuit model post-synthesis, uh, the timing verification tools can just run and check that you're meeting setup time, hold time on all your different flip-flops and things like that. So we don't directly have to go manually do that, right? And, and then we have other fancy tools that'll help check the physical circuits once you're, got, once you're at that level, right? But what this means is that our job as high-level logic designers is to design the functional tests that check logical correctness of our design. And so depending on what we're doing, you know, C, C++, or Verilog models, we have to design some sort of test routine to check that, right? And um, like I said earlier, we have formal verification techniques to help assist in this process, but um, we're not going to discuss that in this course because, again, it gets very complicated. Okay, so the other thing we can do is we can provide timing constraints, right? And so timing constraints will be when we say we want our design to operate at, say, 4 gigahertz, right? But like, this is our desired constraint. And the tool, and maybe even circuit engineers, if you have them, will try and handle that part. They'll, they'll try and make sure that the circuit is laid out in such a way that this is possible. And if it's not, then the tool will give you an error, or the circuit people will be like, this is just not possible. You know, but, so we're not directly checking the timing ourselves in most cases. So let's, we're going to split this up into two parts. And first, we're going to talk about functional verification of our circuits. And then we're going to talk about timing verification, right? So here's, uh, we're going to start with functional verification. And so generally, one, one good approach to functional verification is to use this concept of a test bench. And a test bench is a module that we create specifically to test another design. And so the tested design, or the thing that you're actually trying to test, is called a device under test, the, which we refer to as the DUT. Right? And so a test bench would look something like this, where you have this big module called the test bench, and inside it you have the DUT. And the DUT has some inputs, some outputs, and the purpose of the test bench is to test this. So we have some sort of module here to generate input test patterns, which can you know, uh, basically test different inputs in the DUT. And then we check the output of the DUT using some sort of other logic. So our high-level test bench design will look something like this. And so these test pattern inputs can either be handcrafted values, which you, know, you go ahead and say that I really care about these particular inputs. You know, I want to check these corner cases or something like that. And so you can provide them. Or, or you can automatically generate them. And then it's up to you. you know, do you want to sequentially test every possible input? Or do you want to test particularly random values? You know, whatever you really want to test. And then when we're checking the outputs, we can check the output of the dot manually, again, by just looking at the outputs and being like, this makes sense. Or we can have some sort of fancy golden design that is known to be bug-free and implements the exact same logic as the dot. 
and we can compare outputs and just see whether they match, right? And so we'll talk more about that later in this lecture. Um, so in general, a test bench can be, you know, take the form of whatever. So it can be HDL code written to test other HDL modules. And that's the kind of stuff that you guys will do in lab, right? You're writing a Verilog module to test another Verilog module. Or you can think of it as a circuit schematic, you know? You, you could design a circuit schematic to test other circuit designs. And all of these would be considered test benches, right? But the important takeaway is that the test bench is not designed for hardware synthesis, right? It's not something that you're actually going to go build and try and put on your FPGA or in your circuit design. Um, it runs in simulation only. And so in our case, we have some sort of Verilog simulator, right? Like the Vivado simulator that you guys will work with later. Um, there's also circuit simulators and things like that that will basically simulate your design and you, you just check whether it's correct. You don't try and actually build it. And this is because, you know, test benches usually use simulation only constructs. And an example in Verilog is a wait statement. You know, you tell the simulator, wait for 10 nanoseconds. Okay, that's not something you can actually put in a circuit, right? You can't just make the signal wait. And if similarly, in an actual circuit, you know, you put an ideal voltage or current source, which doesn't exist in the real world. And so you, you can't actually have that. And so it's not suitable to be physically built. Okay. So we're going to cover a couple of common different test bench types that people usually design. Um, so here we're going to have some sort of table with first the type of test bench, how we get our inputs and outputs, and then how we do the error checking, right? And so the first is just what we call a simple test bench, where both of these processes are manual, right? You manually create inputs and outputs, and you manually check whether there's any errors. And then you can have some sort of self-checking test bench where you're still manually providing inputs and outputs, but the test bench itself will check this automatically, whether it's correct or not. And, and third, uh, the fully automatic case, where both of these are automatic. And usually this is what you prefer for a big design, right? Whereas the simple case might be fine for a small design. And so we're going to go through all of these with some different examples. And um, so the, the example we're going to work with here is that we're going to walk through a little module that implements this logic function. And this, this module is written in Verilog. And so we're just going to call it silly function. Okay? It has three inputs, A, B, and C. And it has one output called Y. And it implements this logic function structurally, which means it's implementing it using not gates, AND gates, and OR gates. right? So you, you might ask, why don't we just implement it like this, right? Because it could just be a simple assign statement. It would be a lot easier to read and look at. But in, in theory, like you're testing a design that's kind of complicated, and it's not obvious whether it just works. So we're actually going to look at it as if it's something like this. And we're going to go ahead and test that and test it against this particular easy thing that we, we feel like is correct. OK, so before we jump into some example test benches, we need to talk about some useful syntax for test benching. And um, so. For example here, we have this concept of an initial block, which we briefly touched about last time. But it's, it's very much like an always block. You can put different assignment statements and things like that in it, but it only runs once at the start of simulation. Right? So uh, as an example, you know, we can assign this reg uh, with some value, and then we can tell it to wait 10 nanoseconds. Right? And then we can do a different assignment. And so this is only going to run once at the beginning of simulation. And so it's perfect for our test bench, because it's just going to start, run once, and then, and then finish. Right? Um, we also have access to these type of debugging uh, statements. So here's some syntax called a dollar display, which prints a printf style message, right? And you can print strings and values and whatever you really want using this statement. And so we're going to make use of these in our test benches. And so the first test bench we're considering is the simple test bench where both the inputs and the error check, uh, inputs, outputs, and the error checking are all you know, manually provided. So here's an example of a simple test bench that makes use of the silly function module. And so the test bench has no inputs and outputs because it's not a module we're trying to do anything with, right? It's just for simulation. And then we have some regs and wires declared to pass to our module. And so we have an initial block here, which applies the hard-coded inputs one at a time, right? So we say A, B, and C, we specify their value, and then we wait 10 nanoseconds. Then we specify the value for C, and then we wait 10 nanoseconds. And we repeat this process over and over for as many test cases as we want to test, right? And so what's, what's happening here is that we're providing our dot with lots of different input cases, and then we're just waiting some time so we can actually observe the outputs. And so the, the question is, how would you actually check the outputs of this kind of thing, right? Because the outputs aren't really going anywhere. And so the simulator actually provides a lot of functionality for this. And so the most common thing to do is to look at something called a waveform diagram. And what the waveform diagram does is it breaks down all of your signals one by one, and it gives you their values at different points in time. Right? So here we have time on the x-axis, and so time is increasing. And uh, for example, take the clock signal, right? So as time goes on, the clock is cycling up and down. And maybe every clock cycle, you're expecting something to change. Um, you could look at your input values. You could look at your outputs. I mean, this is just some random example. But it, I mean, it, these could be the signals in your test bench, right? And you could be looking at when these transitions occur, what the values are during those transitions. And it really comes down to you to manually verify that, hey, you know, I see these inputs, and I'm expecting this output. But instead, I saw something else. 
And so something's broken, right? So you'd go back and debug that. And, and, and so really, you have to check for every point in time whether the output is correct. You know, and so this is useful if maybe you have specific inputs you want to test or something like that. But if you're just trying to test lots and lots of inputs, then it's going to be a pain to try and do things this way. So the, the, the pros of this kind of test bench, though, are that it's, it's pretty easy to design, right? Because like, it's very little code. You just kind of put it down, put your test cases that you care about. And, and this means that it's really easy to test a few simple inputs that you really care about. And a good example is corner cases, right? So if you know your design is very complicated for specific values, then you can test those values very quickly and just make sure that your design works. But on the downside, as you might expect, it's not very scalable, right? Because we can only test a few. You know, we're limited by like, how many we can write up by hand, the, the size of our input Verilog file, for example, or, or like, how many we can check in simulation, right? We can look at all these waveforms. Um, and, and that goes to this point that you know, the output must be manually inspected outside of simulation. And so we don't really want to have this case, because then we're going to have to run our simulation and then check something else entirely separate and try and see if our circuit's correct. Okay. So the second type of test bench we're going to consider is a self-checking test bench. But um, we're going to wait till after the break for this, because I think some students want to give a message. So do, do you all want to come up and talk real quick? Yeah. Hallo zusammen. Äh, wie letztes Semester sind wir wieder eure Semestersprecher. Wir wurden wiedergewählt. Äh, zur Erinnerung, ich bin Leo. Das ist Lukas. Auch Lukas. Und Yves ist heute nicht hier. Auf jeden Fall, wie letztes Semester machen wir wieder vier Umfragen, eine für jede Vorlesung. Ähm, und die erste, die für Digital Circuits, schalten wir heute frei. Da könnt ihr hinkommen, entweder indem ihr in der WhatsApp-Gruppe auf den Link klickt, den ich geschickt habe oder indem ihr dem Link da folgt ähm, oder indem ihr eure Edu-App aufmacht und sie da anschaut. Also bitte füllt die aus, das ist wichtig, dann können wir dem Professor Mutlu sagen, was euch gefällt, was euch nicht gefällt und vielleicht die Vorlesung verbessern. Okay, danke. Okay. Right. okay guys. Um, so so I got some feedback that I actually went rather quickly through these slides because I was talking a lot faster than I thought I was. And I also didn't really leave any space for you guys asking questions. So but before I rush on to the next part of the material, do, do you have any questions or anything you want me to explain like in, again or in more detail? I mean, I can leave some time after the lecture too because we'll, we'll be done a little earlier than I thought we would. So <laughs> we can go through and talk about it then. But yeah, so if there's any concepts that were like, you know, just fully unclear or you'd like me to explain again, then um, I guess at the end of the lecture, I'd, I'll, I'll just ask if y'all want me to go over it again, yeah? Okay. Well, anyway, so on with the lecture, I guess. So we've just talked about the, um, the, the manual type of the simple test bench, right? Where you're manually providing the inputs and outputs, and then you're also manually checking the outputs by looking at this waveform diagram. So the purpose of this next test bench, which we call the self-checking test bench, is, is actually to make this process a little bit easier. And so what we really do is that we just add extra if statements inside this initial block to, to check if our outputs are what we expect them to be. So it, it's, it's nothing super complicated, you know? We're just like, if this output, oh yes, I have this pointer. So uh, yeah, so if the output is not what we expected it to be after this uh, 10 nanosecond delay, then we do this dollar display statement where we display something. You know, we can display the inputs that caused it to fail, or we could just print error, whatever we want, you know? It's just, it's just a way of debugging what's going on. But um, the thing to note is that we're still providing the inputs in terms of these hard-coded values and the outputs in terms of more hard-coded values. The, the only part that's really made a little easier here is the checking of the output logic, right? We don't have to look at waveform diagrams anymore uh, unless we're very confused by what's going on. But, but this should take care of a lot of that. So, so the pros of this approach are the same as previously. Like, it's still pretty easy to design, and it's still pretty easy to test a few specific inputs. But also, the simulator will print something whenever an error occurs. It won't just blindly continue, and then you have to go check everything afterwards. But um, on, the, on the downside, you know, it's, it's still not scalable because you're still manually hard coding everything. But in addition to that, it's very easy to make an error in these hard coded values, right? So you, you actually make just as many errors writing a test bench as you do actual code, right? So it's very likely for most of us that we'll screw something up. And then when that happens, the simulator will print error, something bad happened. And then it's very hard to debug whether it's an issue in the test bench or an issue in the DUT, right? And so at that point, we might have to go back to looking at waveform diagrams again or, or something even more complicated to try and figure out where the issue is and whether it's actually a problem, okay? So 
um, we, we can make this process a little bit easier by using this concept of test vectors. So we, we write what's called a test vector file. And effectively, this is a separate file that lists inputs and the expected outputs. Right? And we can create these test vectors either manually by hard coding them in, in this file, or, or we can automatically generate them using some already verified, you know, simple golden model, which again, we'll talk about when it comes to the automatic test bench. But a, an example looks something like this. Right? It's, it's very simple. It's just lists of inputs and outputs, which are separated by the underscore character. So we're going to test all of these input-output pairs one by one. And, and, and yeah, so the, the reason this is very good is because now what we're doing really is we're decoupling the inputs and outputs from our actual test bench code, right? So this is something that you can separately administrate, you can change, you can have different test vector files for different things, while the actual test bench itself just stays effectively the same. And so um, we, we have to come up with some methodology by which we can go through these test vectors one by one, right? And so we do that very simply by using this clock signal. Um, and, and we basically synchronize the testing of the test vectors with this clock signal that we give. So our goal here is to test one test vector each clock cycle, right? So we have to both provide inputs and we have to check the outputs during one clock cycle. And so um, the one way we can do this is we can apply the inputs at the rising edge or, or potentially even sometime after. And then we can go ahead and check the outputs sometime before the next rising edge, right? And um, in the book examples for the H&H &H book, the, the examples rely on the falling edge. So they'll actually be checking the output on the falling edge. So effectively what's happening is that in one clock cycle, you're both applying inputs and checking outputs. And then the next clock cycle happens and you, you, you repeat, right, with the next test vector. And so you do as many clock cycles as you have test vectors effectively. Um, yeah, one thing to keep in mind is that this, this is still functional simula simulation, right? This is not actual model timing. So we're not checking like setup time and hold time and stuff like that here. This, this clock is purely just a test bench construct that's not actually meant to be in the real design. It's just, it's just a way for us to synchronize our testing. Right? So when we go look in our waveform editor, we can be like, hey, we tested this vector on cycle, you know, whatever, 10. And then we, we can easily go to that and talk about it. But, but timing is something separate completely and that we're going to talk about in a later part of this lecture. Right? Okay. And so here there's an example of how you might do this kind of test bench. Um, and it's... It's a little more involved because you have to create this clock cycle and then you have to do things with it. But essentially, it follows the same pattern, right? Um, you, you, you essentially have some declarations and then there's more declarations this time. So you have a, an extra reg variable to, to hold your test vectors, right? And so in this case, we're holding 10,000 test vectors, okay? And so what we're gonna do is that when the test bench starts, we're gonna read those test vectors from the file into this particular array. And then every clock cycle, we're gonna provide one test vector and we're gonna test it all. And so it, it follows a similar path to the other test benches where we instantiate the device under test. And then this time we generate a clock signal, right? And this is purely in test bench again, right? This is just for testing purposes. And it's very simple, you know, just always um, you clock is one, wait five nanoseconds, clock is zero, wait five nanoseconds. And since there's no sensitivity to this, it just keeps doing this over and over, right? So we get a clock signal. Okay, so great, we have a clock signal. And so now we're gonna read um, the test vectors into this test vector array. And so that's very easy. There's a special command in the simulator, uh, in Verilog syntax, which the simulator reads as, you know, read out this file into this, uh, this reg, this, this, this array of regs. And so this particular syntax will read the test vectors from your example.tv file into this array, and then you can start using them. And we also initialize some other variables that we, you know, we care about, like the number of the vector that we're testing right now, the number of errors we've seen, and, and so forth. But um, uh, note that, so this will read them in binary because of the B, so it's assuming binary test vectors. And there's analogous functions, like this one has a H, which represents hexadecimal. So now your test vectors will be in hexadecimal if you use that. You know, so you can use whatever you want for your particular design. Um, <clears throat> so this, um, uh, here is where we actually assign the inputs, right? So um, always at the positive edge of the clock. So on the rising edge of the clock, we wait one nanosecond after the clock, and then we apply inputs and we set our output, right, to the current test vector that we're testing. And um, so this particular example applies the inputs with some delay after the clock, right? You don't necessarily need to do that if you're just testing, but um, the, the book states that this is actually important because inputs should not be changed at the same time with the clock. And this is true to be faithful to actual circuit timing, right? Because if you did this, then you would be effectively getting a hold time violation, right? You need to wait after the clock before you change the inputs. Um, but the, the thing is, in this, in this example with our Verilog and our functional testing, timing is actually not modeled, right? We're, we're just modeling functionality, and so we don't necessarily care. But if you are simulating something else, like a real netlist, which is a, a circuit-level description of your design, then, then you might actually care about timing, and then you do have to worry about this. 
but uh, we, we add this in here just for you guys to understand that this might be the case. And, th and then there's some, there's some extra logic to do all the, the checking if we want, you know? Like if we're in a reset state, then if the output, um, so if we're not, sorry, if we're not in the reset state, then if the output is not what we expected, then we'll print some sort of error. And here's the, the printf style syntax, right? We're printing some binary value, which is a concatenation of A, B, and C. And so we'll know which input vector caused this error. And we can display some errors, we increment some error variable, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, at some point, the test will finish, right? And we've gone through all of our test vectors. So if our test vector, um, if, if basically if we're out of range, and so we're getting some garbage out of this test vectors uh, array, then we'll get a bunch of Xs, and that's just the way the Verilog simulator handles it. Then um, we, we display that we're done, and then we have a dollar finish to signify the end of simulation. Okay, so this is all simulation-specific syntax for the most part, like this, this finish, for example. We, yeah. Okay, so um, going through this design, you know, the, the, the pros are essentially the same as what we had before. The simulator will print an error, and we can still test a few test cases. But also, the, um, this thing about the separation of responsibilities, right? We have no need to change the hard-coded values in the actual test bench when we're trying to test different tests. And we can distribute separate tests for different things and things like that. So we've decoupled that a little bit. And it might be easier to think about in terms of testing. And so in our, in our labs uh, later on in the semester, we're actually going to implement this type of test bench. And we're going to test it with a test vectors file. And so you'll see, you'll get a you know, real example of how this works. <clears throat> on, the, on the downside, again, it's the same sort of thing. It might be very error prone depending on the source of our test vectors. So if, you know, we might be creating it by hand or getting it from somewhere else, but we have to create this huge file. And depending on how many inputs you test, it could become very difficult to deal with. And uh, oh, this is point that I said earlier, you know, you're still limited by reading in a file. And so you might have many more combinational paths to test than will just fit in memory. Right, so if you have a 64 gigabyte file sitting here, the simulator won't just be able to read that into some nice array and then test, right? You, you'll be limited at some point. And so you might have to deal with this issue. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I guess, are there any questions before I move on to the next half of test bench? No? Okay, yeah, it's straightforward. So the last type of test bench we're going to talk about is the automatic test bench. And this relies on this concept of golden models that we've been talking about. So here we're going to define this. So a golden model represents our ideal circuit behavior, right? It's, it's exactly what we want our circuit to do, but it does it in a slightly different way. And the, the, the thing is, this needs to be developed by somebody somewhere. And it might actually be quite difficult to write, but the hope is that this is much easier to write than your complicated design that you're trying to create. And, you know, you could do this however you want. You know, you could do it in C, Perl, Python, MATLAB, you know, Verilog, whatever makes you happy. But you should, be, you should be doing this in such a way that it's much easier to test that this thing is correct. Yeah? And so for our example circuit, a golden model might look like this simpler syntax instead of the horrible structural description we had earlier with and not and or, right? So here, it's, it's kind of an abstracted version. We, we can very easily see the logic function we wanted to implement because it's exactly how the syntax encodes it. And so, um, you, you know, this is, we, we trust that this is much more likely to be correct than the other design. And so um, we're, we're essentially trying to verify the other one using this one, right? And so we can compare inputs and outputs and things like that. And so, oh, yeah, I guess exactly what I said. You know, it's easier to design and understand, and it's much easier to verify this type of design, just even by inspection, than it is something more complicated. So in, in our actual test bench design, um, what we really want to do is we want to compare the outputs of the DUT against the outputs of the golden model, right? So uh, it's, you know, it's, it's quite simple in concept. We have our test pattern generator again, which provides inputs to both the DUT and the golden model, right? And then we just have to compare outputs, like check equality. So what... What this really means is that we don't have to provide outputs, right? We don't, we don't have to figure out what's the correct value that needs to be checked against. We just trust this golden model to do all of that. So all we're really concerned with is this test pattern generator now. We just need to figure out which inputs we actually want to test, which is a much easier problem than you know, sitting there trying to figure out what output's correct for every single test vector. Um, the challenge with this, however, is yes, we need to generate these inputs. And so it's, it's a big question, right? Do we want sequential values to just try and march over the entire input space we have? Or, or do we want random values? Or do we want some other specific values? And you know, if our circuit's really big, our dot has you know, hundreds of inputs, then it's not really feasible to do sequential values at all, right? So we have to come up with really creative ways to test exactly what we care about. OK, well, so with that in mind, here's a, a pretty simple test bench of what this might look like. Right? We have our test bench with some variable declarations, blah, blah, blah. But um, we have two instantiations now. We have the dot and we have the golden model. right? And so we send our inputs, A, B, and C, to both of these. And then we have two outputs, the dot and the golden model output. And um, in our always block, at the falling edge of the clock, we basically check whether the outputs are equal. And if they're equal, then great. It's just like comparing with test vectors. Um, otherwise, you know, we print some sort of error message. 
And then we, here we show some sort of test pattern generator, which is a separate module that will generate you know, inputs to send to these guys. Yes, question? Yeah, in, the, in this particular example, yes. Here, the golden model is um, in Verilog. But actually, so some, some tools, uh, some simulation tools have a lot of really fancy functionality. So suppose you wrote your simulator in C++, right? You can actually hook that up and insert that into Verilog, sort of. And, and like the simulator will kind of allow you to run the C++ code along with the Verilog code. So th there's a lot of extensions like that. Depending on how you're designing, you know, you'd use whatever is comfortable for you. But yeah, in this example, it just looks like a Verilog module. But the Verilog module might have fancier stuff inside it. Yeah, makes sense? OK. Any other questions? No? OK. So yeah, so this is a pretty simple example of what this kind of test bench might look like, right? And so we can go over the pros and cons of this. So the pros, I mean, clearly, it, the output checking is fully automated. And, and this is great, because we don't have to worry about that as a designer. Um, theoretically, we could also compare timing using a golden timing model. I mean, the test bench wouldn't look exactly like it just did when I previously showed it. But we could do this. And you could compare timing back and forth. And, and this would be much easier than trying to verify timing by hand, right? Because you can imagine going into the waveform simulator and looking like every nanosecond, you know, did, the, did it happen yet? Did it happen yet? Whereas something like this is a much more scalable approach to testing that kind of thing. Um, in terms of functional testing, it's very scalable to essentially as much simulation time as you have. Right? You can, this input generator can generate all sorts of inputs. You can test them very quickly. And, and you're not limited by some sort of input file or hard-coded values. Right? And so this could lead to a very high coverage of the input space relative to the prior approaches to test benching that we've just considered. Um, the final point that we make about the pros is that it's, it's just kind of subtle, but it's a better separation of like, engineering roles. So separate designers can actually be made to work on the DUT and the golden model. And um, th th there are essentially different things, right? This DUT is this complicated logic level implementation, whereas the golden model could just be a high level specification of like, you know, what the circuit needs to do in certain cases. And it might be much easier to write or something like that. So two different engineers can work on these different things. And so the engineer who tests the DUT can just focus on important test cases rather than having to focus on the actual functionality and be like, you know, oh, what, what do I expect the output to be in this case? Because this, uh, this other golden model, which was developed by somebody else, will do for you automatically. And so this is great. Um, on the downside, however, you know, the, clearly creating a golden model might be very difficult, especially if your design is very complicated. Right? And so fundamentally, you're trying to do the same thing the golden model is, just in a different way, right? maybe in a more complicated logic level way. So if your problem doesn't allow you to make a simpler, uh, you know, have a simpler way to implement a golden model, then maybe this is not appropriate. And uh, finally, as I mentioned earlier, coming up with good testing inputs might be difficult, right? Because you really have to figure out exactly what you need to test. And this is, this is the challenge of verification, effectively. So uh, this is a, a quick slide on motivating this challenge, right? So even suppose you had this automating testing, right? And you're trying to test a 32-bit adder. That means you have two 32-bit two inputs, right? And so there's two to the 64 possible input combinations. And if you could test one input every nanosecond, it would take you about 60 years to test every possible input combination. Right? And, and this is just for one 32-bit adder, which is a tiny little part of a big design, probably. And so you could imagine how this problem could get easily out of hand, right? And, and so this is where the challenge of figuring out particular input test cases comes in. So if you're trying to test a giant processor which can run arbitrary pieces of code, how, how do you decide what to test, right? And so brute force testing is not feasible, OK? So we need to figure out what we need to test. And so this is where formal verification methods actually come in quite handy, because you can you know, formally check whether this logic does exactly what you want it to, which means you can test which input cases you actually have to worry about and which you don't. And um, yeah, so somehow you have to do this, and this is part of the challenge. And so the takeaway is that verification is a very hard problem. And for the simple designs we'll see in the labs in this class and things like that, it might be feasible to go through all input cases and just check. But in, in like the real world on like a huge design, it's, it's a big deal. OK. So, um, the next part is on timing verification, and it's actually the last part of the lecture. So any questions before we move on to that? Huh? OK. So timing verification is the other side of the problem, right? So we've just looked at functional verification to make sure that all the logic is correct. So now we want to make sure that our setup time and hold time and all of these different timing constraints are met, right? And so we have a few approaches to this. And so we're going to talk about two of them here. So the first approach is using a high-level simulation. And so like Verilog, such that we'll use in this lab. In, in these class labs, or you know, some C, C++ model. And in Verilog, for example, we can model timing using these uh, delay statements, right? And we can add that into the dot. And so what happens is if we're using some sort of hierarchical model, we can add these sort of delays into our low-level components, so flip-flops, basic gates, and memories, and things like that, 
we can add these delays, like the, the pound, whatever, you know, whatever delay you want. And you could be like, this gate takes whatever number of nanoseconds to produce an output. And during simulation, the simulator will observe all of those, right? So your gate won't evaluate for whatever delay you put inside it. And then in the, in the waveform diagram that you look at afterwards, your timing will sort of be modeled, right? You'll, you'll sort of see like this gate didn't change for a while and this logic took really long and some, something like that. And so we have some notion of timing in the high level design then. Like your dot will sort of model timing. Um, the problem is that this is not as accurate as real circuit timing, of course, right? Because you, you can only do so much. There's only so many things you can model inside the Verilog model. And at some point, like if you look at some designs that are shipped by Xilinx itself, they try and model timing and these files become like thousands and thousands of lines with lots of different conditions for different timing constraints. And it gets very complicated and hard to manage, right? And so that's where circuit level timing verification comes in, right? But the problem with this is that you can't run this on your Verilog description of your design, right? You need to do it on actual circuits. And so you first have to run the synthesis tool to design actual circuits. And um, you know, then there's this process called implementation where you place and route your design to an actual circuit chip. And um, <clears throat> effectively, there's no real one way to do this, because the problem is depending on what you're targeting, the circuits look very different, right? So in FPGAs, you're mapping everything to these logic blocks that are distributed around the chip. And the timing constraints are really, you know, getting logic from, uh, you know, getting a signal from one log lookup table to like another one through the interconnect. But if you're targeting, say, like an actual circuit implementation, like a, some sort of ASIC or something, then you would purely have you know, flip-flops you could put wherever you want, logic you could put wherever you want, and you have to figure out timing with that. So what really happens is that you have tools that are very specific to particular design flows, right? And so with our, with our FPGAs and our labs, we are using the Xilinx Vivado tool, right? And it, it lets you do synthesis, it lets you do place and route and run simulations and things like that. But all of, this, all of those things are very specific to the FPGA that we're using. Um, if you were doing VLSI design, for example, I don't know if you, you may have heard of these tools like Synopsis and Cadence, but they're, they're used for like actually designing you know, circuits that are going to the silicon fab. So, so anyway, the, the takeaway is that this part of the verification is actually very specific to what you're trying to do. And so we, we have some good news here. And the good news is that these tools that magically have, you know, that the, the vendor gives you will, will actually try and meet timing for you. And they'll try and meet uh, setup times, hold times, clock skews. And that's really why this process takes so long, right? So when you run synthesis, and you run you know, implementation, and you're waiting so long for the tool to evaluate, it's doing all of this. It's trying to figure out a circuit layout for your logic design that will actually meet all of these timing constraints. And, and it's great. It usually gives you some sort of timing report or timing summary, which is like some document that summarizes what happened, right? And so this will include the worst case delay paths it found when it was trying to meet timing, um, the maximum operating frequency you could get, right, which is, again, determined by the set of time constraints, and any other timing errors that were found, right? They'll all be listed in this sort of summary, and you can take a look at it and we'll actually do that in the labs. But the, the bad news, however, is that it's actually possible for the tool to fail to find a solution. Right? Because it's, it's, a, it's a very hard problem to figure out how to map your logic to circuits. And you know, this could happen for a number of reasons. Like maybe the desired clock frequency that you requested is way too aggressive. Right? And so this could result in setup time violations on a particularly long path, or, or you know, it could do all sorts of things. And it's possible the tool won't be able to find a solution that meets your constraint. And in that case, it'll just have to tell you. It'll be like, you know, this path did not meet timing constraints and then you have to do something about it. Um, you could have too much logic on your clock paths, for example. Like we talked about clock skew, right? So if you start putting logic on the clock path, like maybe an enable or disable or something like this, then you're starting to introduce clock skew. And maybe this clock skew amounts to so much that your design just doesn't work anymore. And the tool sort of tries to manage this for you, but at some point, if it can't, it will fail. Um, there's also this concept of asynchronous logic, which is not on the same clock that you're using for your design. And we haven't talked about it here because it gets rather complicated, but you know, it's, it's in some of the reading material, and you can look up more if you're interested. But it can also lead to a bunch of issues because you could be violating input timing wherever a, a signal is not tied to the clock that you're using. Um, what, what actually happens in this case when something fails is that the tool will hopefully provide you with some useful errors, right? So the report will contain some paths that will fail to meet timing, right? So it's unclear whether these paths will help you figure out, like, whether you can actually fix the problem, but it's somewhere to start debugging, right? And so our question is, if you do run into this case where the tool fails to find a solution, how, how can we do something about it? Like, how can we fix these problems? And so this is, this is generally a problem because it, it's a very manual process and often you have to iterate over and over uh, to, to find a solution that actually works. And especially if you have very strict constraints, like suppose you really need to meet a specific clock frequency or something like that, it can be very hard to do that. And so some options that you have available to you with the tools are that you can try rerunning synthesis in place and route with different options, 
So all these algorithms to do this place and route and the synthesis are very complicated and they have a bunch of parameters, right? And so one easy parameter is a random seed. Like they'll actually take in random seeds, right? So you can change that and hope that it converges to a better solution. If, if that doesn't work for you, you can manually provide hints for place and route. Like you can, you know, you can be like, I know I'm putting this gigantic memory in my design. I want it to be placed in this part of the chip. And then the tool will observe those constraints when it's doing its algorithm, right? Or you could be like, I know this path is very long. I want it placed here or something like this. You can manually provide all these. But this is very involved and takes a lot of effort on the designer's part. Um, it really comes down to manual optimization if none of this works, right? So the problem paths will be reported in the timing report. And it's up to you to simplify complicated logic, right? Like maybe in your logic, your, your Verilog description, you've specified something that's just too difficult to deal with. It requires too many gate delays or something like that, and nothing's going to happen. And, and so it's up to you as the designer to split up these long combinational paths into separate stages, you know, put some sort of flip-flop in between. Uh, re essentially, like, what you need to do is redesign your logic to meet timing more easily, right? And so um, just one more thing, if you recall, like, you actually fix hold time by increasing the amount of logic, right? By adding more delay on the, on the short paths. But this could also affect your long paths, too. Like, you could, every time you make a change, you're changing where your critical path is, where your shortest path is, and all these time constraints completely change, right? So this is why it becomes a very iterative process, because you make a change, and then you see what it does, and then it doesn't work, so you try again with something else. You know, it, it, gets, it gets very hard. But um, hopefully you won't deal with this too much in the, in, in the labs we have here, because the designs are rather simple. But if you do start using aggressive constraints and things like that, you may. And so then you'll have to take some approach like this. OK. <clears throat> um, so this is now the lecture summary. So do you have any questions about what we just talked about before I move forward? No? OK. So um, just what we went over real quick, we, uh, just to summarize, you know, we went over combinational circuits, which included both propagation and contamination delay, which are the longest and shortest possible delays through our circuit, right? And then we talked about circuit glitches, where the output makes multiple transitions for a single input transition. Um, we talked about timing in sequential circuits, which include setup and hold time constraints. And then we figured out how we can sort of determine how fast a circuit operates and whether it'll actually work if it meets hold time. And then finally, we talked about circuit verification, which is you know, how to make sure that a circuit actually works correctly. And this takes multiple parts, like functional verification and timing verification. And we talked about different approaches to that by using test benches for functional verification and uh, sort of exploring what the tools might look like for timing verification. Right? OK, so that's the contents of the lecture. So thanks, guys. But um, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so we actually have quite a bit of time left over. And so I, I, I know I went quite quickly through the beginning material, especially. So are there any particular concepts you want me to kind of go over again, maybe in a little more detail, because they weren't quite fully understood? So anything? Yeah. A setup time? Yeah. Um, so just the concept of like setup and hold time, you mean? Uh, yeah, OK. Yeah, um, I can go through that again real quick, just, just so we can clarify that. So the main part, uh, so, <clears throat> so um, yeah, hey guys, if you, if you need to leave, could you please leave quietly so I could continue explaining? Um, yeah, so this is the main slide that talked about that, right? And so we have these concepts of setup time and hold time, where what we're saying is that this D input to the, to the flip-flop um, needs to kind of be stable before and after the active clock edge, right? And so what this really means is, is that um, where, it's hash where the, the, you have this cross-hatching, the input could be anything, right? It could be changing back and forth. It could do whatever it wants. But slightly before the clock edge and slightly after, it, it needs to all just be either a stable zero or a stable one. And if you don't, then you get into this case of metastability, right? Where it becomes non-deterministic and you get some garbage out. And um, so setup time refers to the amount of time before this active clock edge that you need to hold it stable, right? So it needs to just be a fixed zero or one sometime before the clock edge in order to be, guarantee safety. And then for hold time, it's the analogous concept after, right? It needs to remain that same zero or one in order to have safe operation. And so... Again, these are like, you know, max, uh, best case and worst case sort of things, right? So you, this is uh, the earliest possible time that you need to be safe and the latest possible time that you need to be safe. And so if you want your circuit to operate correctly with the abstraction of digital logic, where everything is just ones and zeros being passed around, you need to obey this. Okay, just, just straight up. You, you, you need to make sure you obey this in all of your flip-flops in the design.
And if you don't do that, then you're no longer working with digital logic, because now you're going to start getting some analog behavior out of your flip-flop. The output's going to be something weird and non-deterministic, and, and you can't really work with it anymore, at, at least at a functional logic level. Um, is, that, is that what you were asking about? Does that make sense? Yeah. And so when we talked about our, so yeah, the illustration metastability, but when we talked about our timing um, and the sequential system timing, we were saying that we really need to make sure that we meet timing here, right? So this D2 is the one that we can control the setup and hold time for, right? And so in order to meet the setup and hold times here, we have to control our combinational logic delay because that's the only parameter really available to us, right? This and then the clock frequency. And so we need to make sure that this D2 doesn't come too early or come too late. And th if we do that, then we're guaranteed that this flip-flop will operate with a digital one or zero, and it will store our value exactly like we expect. Yeah? Is, it, is, is that concept more clear then? Yeah, OK. Um, is, there, is there anything else that you guys found a little confusing that maybe I could go over again? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so the, so the, yeah. So the question is, if you have a clock where it's a one value more than the other, right? Like if it's one longer than it is zero, then um, how do you really how, like what, what does that really mean? I guess so. In terms of the clock frequency, it's it, it doesn't really matter, right? Because as long as it's periodic and the one time and the zero time are the same for every period, then you're, like, if you're clocking your flip-flop um, here, if your flip-flop's being clocked on a rising edge, say, every rising edge still comes at some specific frequency, right? And so there, you, you don't care at all. But if you're worrying about both uh, the rising edge and the falling edge, now there's, it's going to be a little weird, right? Because the time between the rising and falling will be shorter or longer than the time between that falling and the rising. Yeah, and so in the example yesterday in lecture, we had this clock that was originally just a normal clock, but then we divided it by three. And so we had a, a state machine that actually ended up being two-thirds one and then one-third zero, right? And so your clock was a little weird. So if you're synchronizing your flip-flops on just the rising edge or the falling edge exclusively, then you're fine, right? It's just, it's just a different clock. Like, it, it doesn't really matter. It's just something that's periodic. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to exploit the properties of the fact that it's one more than it is zero or something like that, then that would start becoming a very like custom sort of design, you know. I mean, you could be creative with that if you wanted. Yeah, but like, yeah, it's not fundamentally different from a regular clock. Is essentially what we're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, if if there's no more que any any more questions, because otherwise we're effectively done. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. I guess enjoy your Friday, guys. We'll get out a little early. Yeah. Thank you.